Chapter 2 The guy smells strongly of drink, Electra offered in the silence. She was a trusted member of the team, one that Augustine valued more every day. It was on occasions like this that he could rely on Electra to break the silence. Drink or drugs seemed to be a regular part of many murders. Augustine wanted to get away from this place. The invasion on his senses of alcohol on top of the usual smells of murder was just too much. It was all he could manage to block out the smells of death, the blood, the bodily fluid secreted after the last breath was taken, without having another smell piled on top to invade his senses. He had to escape. But there was no way to escape physically. He had to do it mentally. Augustine had always spent time taking walks in his mind, while the rest of humanity, or so it seemed, were eating McDonald's and playing video games, he was living in his imagination. It was a much saner world. He could navigate around places he hadn't been for years inside his mind, taking turns left and right until he understood the place just as well as if he was stood there. If he needed to sleep, he would go to a calm and restful place. If he needed adrenaline, then he would find a place where he was scared in the past, or a place where he had to work hard. Gordon's gin factory was a place where he was able to relax. Augustine had worked there while at uni, hoping to make some extra cash to pay off a bit of debt. But it was more to have a stack of cash for drink when he arrived back on campus. Whiskey was his tipple back in those days, and he liked it American, Jack Daniels, Southern Comfort, Jim Bean or Wild Turkey, but with Coke. Nothing else seemed to hit the right spot. Pre-drinking was the only way he could get drunk more than once per week. He just didn't have the cash to do it any other way, even with the 1990s pub prices. Half a bottle of Jack in his room before appearing for the night was the norm. But now, Augustine hadn't seen a bottle of whiskey in many years. It was part of the job staying away from the drink so he was fresh in the morning. Social drinking was the norm. Getting loaded before he left home just wasn't part of the plan any longer. Unless the drink cuts his throat, then we're not entirely sure that's the cause of death, are we? Gary offered by way of riposte. He couldn't let someone else have the last word, even if he hadn't been quick thinking enough to deliver the first. The group of detectives looked up from the corpse and across at Gary, who had his gaze decidedly fixed on Electra. All were watching for a response. None was given by either party. Let's keep talking, said Augustine, now back in the room. This room was in the Campanile Hotel in the Ayton district of Washington, just off the A1, the main road between the capitals of England and Scotland. I think that if we talk this out, we'll start to get somewhere. Lou, what do you have? Augustine wanted the team to discuss what was in front of them. He thought it best if that conversation was steered clear of the tension between Gary and Electra. It was apparent to him that the rest of them were stunned by the outward aggression shown by each of these towards the other. The team hadn't been formed that long in its entirety, and Augustine wanted it to stay that way. Electra was his lieutenant having worked her way up with Augustine over a number of years. Gary was the man that nobody else in the force wanted to work with. Augustine took him under pressure from his former boss. People told him that he'd regret it. He was starting to see what they meant. I feel like this is more than a simple killing, Lou started. He was by far the oldest member of the team. That brought with it a calmness that was missing from the earlier exchanges. Augustine wished that he could have some of Lou's calmness at times. We all knew John. He didn't make friends easily, but could lose friends quite quickly if he wanted to. They will say at his funeral that he didn't suffer fools gladly. I think that's an understatement. He often went out of his way to find those fools and let them know what he thought of them. And then there's his job. He was in the firing line every day, all day, Lou continued, maintaining eye contact with Gary throughout 
so that he didn't have his time cut short. Lou was aware that time wasn't on his side, more aware than the youngsters in the team would be for some time. Because of this, he found it important to have his voice heard when he had something to say. All the others respected that. Gary accepted it. But Lou felt the need to make sure he had Gary under control when he spoke in the group. Now the floor could open up, Lou thought. Only now that I've had my say. But we're all in a similar role, Lou, and none of us end up like this, Augustine countered, looking for a conversation rather than a series of monologues. And I hope with all my heart that none of us will, but we have to accept that his job might have something to do with the predicament he is in right now. Lou spoke with his eyes now bouncing around the rest of the team, looking as much as Augustine for this to open up. So we need to speak to his employers? Ash spoke. He was the fifth and final member of the team, always wanting to be present when an investigation started. He had arrived on his day off, a few minutes after the rest of them. Augustine had given him a call as they set off. It wasn't procedure, but Ash was enthusiastic to a level that could only be embraced. Augustine loved having him on board. Yes, and we need to speak to the maid who found him like this. It can't have been easy for her, Electra offered, always putting the human touch forward. So, we have a few things to get on with. Ash, you're on with the employers. Electra, the maid. Gary, how about speaking to the other people who run the hotel? Managers, reception staff, and let's see what CCTV they have, if any. Lou, that leaves the other nearby businesses. Hopefully there will be something unusual that sparks our interest. I'll coordinate things from a room the hotel has kindly offered us on the ground floor. I doubt there will be much demand for rooms to have business meetings or the like here for a short while, once the news is out. So, any questions? Augustine asked. He was faced with people looking down at the body, hoping that someone else would address the elephant in the room. The body had its eyes removed. They were laid across the carpet, presumably placed looking straight back at the body, as though they held the clue to the identity of the killer. Augustine knew that he would have to address this situation before they moved on. Eyes are a funny thing. They give us access to the entire world of colours, shapes and movements. But they say that a person born blind doesn't miss any of this. It's not like their experience of the world states that they should have five senses. It's not like they have this huge gap in their life where they feel sight should be. Contrast this to someone who was born sighted and loses that later in life. Do they feel this gaping hole where they once had sight? They feel like they were missing out on something. And they are probably right. The eyes are the window to the soul. But that's for people looking in. For those looking out, the eyes are the windows to the world. We underestimate vision. We take it for granted. When the world looks like an amazing place, we thank God, Buddha, Allah, and everyone else for the gift we have been given. When we don't like the world around us, we put our hands over our eyes. The world isn't any different. We just can't absorb quite as much of it because we have deprived one of our senses. And I think these eyes are some kind of clue from the killer. Why can't a death just be a death? Why do we end up dealing with psychos that have to play with the body after? Isn't it just enough to kill? Electra asked, as though she was in a state of despair. 